think we've probably all heard about enough of Moldova for one day, but um, I will just share one quick answer to prayer. I, I had a heavy chest cold as I went out to Moldova, and predictably uh, it became a chest infection within a couple of days of arriving there. Uh, it would normally send me scurrying to the GP to get some antibiotics. Um, not quite so straightforward when you're away from home. So I mentioned this to one of the church leaders, and uh, he said, oh, not a problem, wait here. And he popped across the road to the chemist and came back with a course of antibiotics. <laughs> so it's an interesting place, fun, wonderful place in so many ways. And uh, uh, I will be, God willing, going back there in the spring where I've been invited to speak at the, the, the Bible school. And uh, I'll tell you more about that as the time draws, draws closer. Well, it, it's been a funny old year, hasn't it? <laughs> and uh, with the coming of the Omicron variant and the... I'm not making a political point here, just a, a practical observation. With the shambles, which seems to typify number 10 and all that surrounds it at the moment, it looks like the year is going to end as strangely as it, as it began. And perhaps for you, the year has crawled by. Uh, it's almost as if COVID has kind of put a handbrake on, some of us may feel. Perhaps for you, the year has raced by. Well, either way, Christmas is, uh, is nearly here. And possibly one of the things which we have learned in the last year or so is we've learned a little bit more about what it takes to be really content. Um, what I mean is, I'm going to really appreciate this Christmas a number of very basic things. Um, it doesn't take a lot to make us happy when you come right down to it. A roof over our head, a, a table to sit around and food on the table, and most importantly, the company of some of the people whom we love. These are the really important things, aren't they? The rest is, frankly, window dressing to a large degree. Now, don't get me wrong, if, if you have already bought or intending to buy me a Christmas present, please, <laughs> please feel free, don't, don't get Amazon to collect it and take it away again. I'll, I'll happily have all the window dressing you can throw at me. But maybe we've just learnt a little bit about what it takes to be really, really content. Well, we are pressing on now with our Christmas series, Angels and Shepherds, uh, last week. And next week, God willing, Darren will focus our thoughts on the, uh, the baby, on Jesus himself. And to me, it falls to speak about the parents, by which I take it, uh, we, we are talking, at least in this instance, about Mary and Joseph. So let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, please. And chapter 1 and verse 18. Gospel according to St. Matthew. That's... Uh, converted tax collector who left everything to follow Jesus or perhaps more accurately as someone once said he left everything but his pen because he went on to write this incredible book which bears his name and uh, Matthew is one of those who records some of the details of the incarnation of the coming into the world of Christ so Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. He will live up to his name. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. 
but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Not many children get to choose their parents, do they? Arguably, almost no children get to choose their parents. Even the adoption process does not require parents to line up so the child can make a selection. So children generally don't get to choose their parents, but Jesus did. As the Son of God, and as God the Son, he did. The simplicity, even the squalor of the place where he was born, his idea. The selection of Mary, with her willing compliance, of course. The selection of Mary to bear him, his idea. The choice of Joseph as her husband and as his stepfather, all his doing. He got to choose. And out of all the many millions of people in the world at that time, of course, seven billion now, fewer then, but out of all the people in the world that time, he chose these two. He chose Mary and he chose Joseph. So why Mary? Why Joseph? They were not, after all, when all said and done, they were not perfect people. They could not be. The Bible says there is no one righteous. Not one, not even the best of us. The Bible says all we like sheep, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us. There's no exemption clause there for Mary or for Joseph. We've turned every one of us to our own way. Even Mary herself in her wonderful song, which we know as a Magnificat, said, my spirit doth rejoice in God my saviour. There's that sort of implicit acknowledgement, even from Mary, that she needed a saviour. Also, it might be noted that with regard to Mary, despite the circumstances of his conception and the circumstances of his birth, uh, she may well have lost the plot at least once about Christ's identity and his destiny and his mission. It seems to be hinted at in the Gospel according to Mark. As she loving-heartedly but completely wrong-headedly tried to turn him away from doing what God had called him to do. So Mary wasn't a perfect person and nor was Joseph. He was, of course, her husband by arranged marriage the Bible has a, lot, it has a lot of record about arranged marriages. I'm personally convinced on that basis that arranged marriage is not necessarily wrong. Arranged marriage is not the same as forced marriage. Let's be clear about that. This was an arranged marriage. It was not a forced marriage. And we see that Joseph was initially not just mildly sceptical, but frankly disbelieving about the story which Mary had, her account of a visit from the angel. But imperfect though they both were, I think it's safe to think that of all the rest, they were the best. They were the best. Two quite remarkable people. Now I want to notice three things about Mary as we're focusing on the parents, which we, I think, can notice, we can admire, and perhaps we can emulate. And the first one is this, her intelligence. Her intelligence. Her question to the angel on being told she would be that she would conceive or had conceived a child was, how can this be? It was an obvious and entirely reasonable question. She was not a simpleton. She was of marriageable age and she understood what we call the facts of life. Secondly, let's notice her purity. How can this be, she said, for I am a virgin, I have not known a man. Listen, there's a lot of pressure on young people today to lose their virginity. Uh, frankly, there always has been. But I genuinely believe it's worse these days. Uh, tremendous pressure on people to fornicate, to be immoral. And there would have been pressure on Mary. And there would have been pressure on all young people. I suspect that teenage boys in the first century in Israel had pretty much the same thing on their minds lots of the time that teenage boys in the 21st century in Coventry have on their mind. And so there would have been pressure for them to be immoral. But Mary said to the angel, how can this be for I am a virgin? And the angel, of course, did not contradict her. The angel knew that to be the case. 
So we notice her intelligence and her reasonable question. When God tells us something which sounds unreasonable, it's not an unreasonable thing to ask him for a reason or to ask him for an explanation. And we notice her purity. And thirdly, we notice her obedience. I am the Lord's servant, she said. This was not some sort of divine rape. Mary was a willing, compliant servant of the Lord in this situation. She heard and she understood what God wanted. She understood the probable consequences, but she was willing to be used by God. Three simple things about Mary. Her intelligence, her purity, and her willingness to serve the Lord. And then Joseph. Incidentally, I don't think there's any compelling reason in the Bible or anywhere else to believe that Joseph was, as he is often pictured, a much older man than Mary. I think it's far more probable they were matched together by a professional matchmaker and their parents when they were both children. And of course they would have been married in those days in their mid to late teens. I, and uh, the only thing it seems to support the idea that he might have been a lot older than Mary is that once Jesus has turned 12, we read nothing else about him. It's generally supposed that Joseph had died, as if old age was the only way that you could die in first century Israel. I see them as a young couple, very much in love, excitedly planning their futures together, and then uh, uh, absorbing and dealing with and responding with the incredible news that Mary is going to bear the Son of God. I notice a number of things about Joseph. You might like to count them with me because I've left exactly how many of them are out of my notes. First of all, he was very careful about obeying God's law, which for him would have been the Old Testament scriptures, the law. We're told he was a just man, a righteous man. Uh, that, in that context, really means a law-abiding man. God's law mattered to Joseph. He was resolved to obey the law, not just when it was convenient, but when it would be costly. At the very least, if he obeyed the law and brought the force of the law down to bear on Mary, it would have cost him Mary. Whether it would have cost Mary her life is something I think can be debated. Old Testament law required Mary to be stoned if she was found to have committed adultery. But whether under the Roman occupation they would have been able to carry that out, I don't know. But the shame and the loss and the humiliation would have been enormous for Mary. And it would have cost Joseph his wife. But he was committed to keeping God's law. However, secondly, he was also compassionate. He was a righteous man. He was not a self-righteous man. Self-righteous people are really compassionate. Self-righteous people have little pity for other people. Little tolerance for their mistakes and even less for their sins. Joseph wasn't self-righteous. He was righteous. He wanted to do what God said should be done. But he was also compassionate. And he looked for a way to honour God's word and keep his wife from being harmed. And thirdly, he was very sensitive to hear from God. Very sensitive to hear from God. Three times in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1 and 2, we read about Joseph being spoken to by God. When was the last time we were spoken to by God? Have you been reading in the Bible recently and something just that you've read perhaps a thousand times before suddenly struck you with new force? A sense that God was underlining it to you. One or two people sent me messages while I was away saying the Lord had given them this verse. I think, Barbara, you did that. A verse, a passage from Scripture had been on your mind. You felt God had spoken and you passed it on. Joseph was a man who was sensitive to hear God's voice. Chapter 1, verse 10. The angel said to him in a dream, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Chapter 2, verse 13, the angel said to him in a dream, take the child and escape to Egypt. Chapter 2, verse 19, the angel appeared in a dream. Did a lot of dreaming, didn't he, Joseph? <laughs> God never speaks to me in dreams. That's probably because I suffer from insomnia, so I don't do a whole lot of dreaming. But God does speak to people in dreams, you know. Of course, when God says something to us, if we feel he's spoken to us in a dream, if he's given us a vision, we need to check that out with God's word. We will probably be in order if we then go to some older, perhaps wiser Christian people and just run it past them as well, the pastors or the elders 
of the church. But God does speak to people in dreams. Most of the time, I suspect, God speaks to us when we read his word or when we hear it being explained. The important thing is to be open to hear from God, as Joseph was. And not only was he open to hear, but he was quick to obey. He did take Mary to be his wife. He did take the child and escape to Egypt. That could hardly have been convenient. And he did bring the child back to Israel and thus unconsciously enable Jesus to fulfill scriptural prophecy. Notice fourthly, I don't make a big point out of this, but I just touch it in passing. Joseph was in control of his family. Interesting, isn't it? The angels spoke to Joseph. Now, it was a patriarchal society. But there is a scriptural principle that the man is the head of the home. And often God wants to speak to the men, to the husband and the father in the home, and tell them what he wants. And then the family are expected, generally speaking, to follow. Joseph was in control. He was head of his house. And he gave leadership where leadership was needed. Notice, fifthly, his commitment to accept Mary and to raise Jesus was no flash in the pan, was it? Um, the, the, the 150 or so that I can testify who responded in recent meetings in that place, which we won't name anymore. Um, I know, look, when, when somebody, when I pray at the end of a meeting, say, now look, you, you, I, I, this is, let me give you a little taste of Moldova. We're, we're in a home, or maybe in a church, and I've just spent 15, 20 minutes explaining about sin, what it is, what it does, how it cuts us off from God, what God has done about it. How he sent his son who did no sin. So didn't deserve to be cut off from God. How he died on a cross to make it possible for us to be forgiven. How we need to repent and believe. I've just been explaining that. 20 minutes of me speaking, that's 40 minutes altogether because of course you've got the translation. And then I will say now, if you, if you're, if you're, you want to repent and believe... You want to receive Christ as your saviour. I'm going to pray a prayer out loud, just a few words at a time. You will hear it translated. And when we've heard the translation, it's your chance to pray. And then I lead people in a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Blah, 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 blah. Then they all join in. Or some do. There's no pressure. Thank you for dying for me. Please forgive me for my sin. Lord, I turn away from all that is wrong in my life. And I invite Christ to come into my life and be my saviour. A little prayer like that. And then I will say, now, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to show me you've done so. Just raise your hand. Or maybe just leave where you're sitting and come and stand at the front. And some people do and some people don't. And sometimes, when you, particularly when you're inviting people to walk to the front of a meeting, it's true here. I used to do it in the tent. We've had a tent campaign here so, uh, uh, on the green here. I do it several times each year here in the UK, there's often a heart-stopping moment when no one moves and then one person, and then two, and then three, and then that becomes a trickle, and then sometimes it becomes more than a trickle. It's a wonderful, wonderful moment. But the people who do that, we do not call them converts. We call them responders or inquirers. I've done it at the University of Warwick, that's at the end of university mission. We don't call them converts, we call them inquirers or responders. And I know that some of the people who put their hand up or walk forward or show some sort of interest, I, I, I know that, that it's a thing of a moment. It'll be forgotten already by the time they've got back to their homes. People do this sort of thing for all sorts of reasons. That's all right. Get everybody forward. Let the Lord sort them out. Okay? Um, but that wasn't the case with Joseph. His decision wasn't the thing of a moment. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. And I'm going to be careful because I've never really heard anybody else ever make a point about this. But in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, we read, He had no union with her until Jesus was born. To lie next to Mary every night as man and wife, but without full sexual intimacy. That was a big commitment. That was a big thing to do, wasn't it? It showed how seriously he took 
what had happened and his responsibility. Now, was it biologically necessary for him to do that? Actually, no, it wasn't. We know that now. He may not have realised that then. Did he do it for the sake of public testimony so that people would know that Jesus was God's son, not his? Well, almost certainly not. Because nobody else outside Mary and himself would know whether they were having sex. Did he do it to resolve any doubts he himself had? No, if he'd had those doubts, he wouldn't have married her in the first place. So we don't really know why he did that, although Matthew records that he did. It was customary among the Jews for couples to refrain from intercourse when the wife was, was pregnant, at least heavily pregnant. But whatever his reason, he saw it as part of his ongoing commitment. The decision he made one day when he woke from a dream was a decision which he stuck to. And the decision to follow Christ is not just the decision of a lifetime in its importance, it is a decision for a lifetime. Follow through. Stick to the commitment you have made to follow Jesus and serve him. It takes a great deal to satisfy my appetite for preaching, but I think we've just got to that point. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the record of these wonderful people. Thank you for the parents that the Lord Jesus had. We're so glad that as he was to face such rejection and hostility and cruelty as a man, that Lord, his young years, his tender years, where he was safe in a family who loved him and and cared for him. We're glad of that. We thank you for the example that Mary and Joseph set us of commitment and the willingness to obey God and to, to stick with the program. Uh, Lord, so as we turn our thoughts next week to thinking about the Lord Jesus himself, we pray right now for Darren that you will open his lips to tell us wonderful things from your word. And our hearts will be warmed and touched and changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. The Lord bless you.